How to improve infantry survivability on the battlefield has always been a top priority for military forces worldwide. During World War I, the British and French proposed a solution by using tanks to clear the way for infantry, essentially serving as mobile artillery and shields for the infantry, thus reducing infantry casualties. However, with the outbreak of World War II and the German assertion that tanks are the best anti-tank weapons, the combat role of tanks supporting infantry was partially separated and designated for anti-tank combat. At that time, the idea of developing dedicated firepower support vehicles for infantry emerged. It was believed that these vehicles, specifically designed to support infantry, would typically employ low-pressure short-barreled howitzers as their primary weapons. Several factors influenced this decision. Firstly, these armored vehicles were generally not intended to engage enemy armored units head-on. Even if they did encounter such units, they would still have some capability to fight back. With the development of high-explosive anti-tank ammunition during World War II, short-barreled large-caliber howitzers could effectively engage enemy armored targets. Secondly, during World War II, due to technological limitations in material science, there was often a trade-off between high-explosive shells with larger propellant charges and thinner walls or smaller propellant charges and thicker walls. Obviously, when facing enemy fortifications and similar targets, he shells with more propellant were more effective. However, if the barrel length was increased, the chamber pressure would inevitably increase. Therefore, in World War II, short-barreled guns were a necessary prerequisite for launching these shells with large propellant charges. Lastly, in the process of supporting infantry, firepower support vehicles would typically engage stationary targets such as enemy bunkers, emplacements, machine gun nests, and anti-tank guns. Therefore, they did not require the high muzzle velocity provided by long-barreled guns to assist with aiming. Short-barreled low-pressure guns had lower costs, lower technological requirements, and were more suitable for large-scale production of these infantry support vehicles. Therefore, in summary, we can observe that the first generation of infantry support vehicles that emerged during World War II generally exhibited the following characteristics, short-barreled low-pressure guns and large e-shells. Additionally, due to some countries' military definitions of infantry support vehicles as self-propelled artillery supporting infantry, some of these vehicles did not have turrets. In typical examples of World War II firepower support vehicles, the Germans had the Sturmgeschütz 3 and 4, the Americans had the M8 Scott and M4 105, the Russians had the SU-122 and ISU-152, and the British had the Cromwell MK.VI with an added 95mm howitzer. These vehicles collectively formed the types of infantry firepower support vehicles during World War II. However, from these vehicles, we can also see that they were mostly designed and manufactured using tank chassis. During World War II, tank chassis were not overly expensive. However, in the Cold War era, with the emergence of rifled tank guns that had excellent armor-piercing and anti-personnel capabilities, along with the abandonment of the tonnage classification system for tanks in favor of the concept of main battle tanks, tank prices soared. Manufacturing firepower support vehicles using tank chassis became cost inefficient. A classic example is during the Cold War when the U.S. and British armies simultaneously used an engineering vehicle with a 165mm gun. The U.S. used the M728 based on the M60A1 chassis, while the British used the Centurion MK.5 AVRE based on the Centurion MK.5 chassis. However, it's important to note that these vehicles, compared to the direct infantry support firepower vehicles of World War II, were actually different. Strictly speaking, these vehicles were called combat engineering vehicles. They were not supporting infantry, but rather supporting tank battles. They carried dozer blades and cranes and could clear the way for tanks. And when faced with blocked passages, the 165mm demolition gun serves as a means of remote explosive delivery, capable of blasting through obstacles and allowing tanks to continue advancing. This usage method was actually employed by the British Royal Engineers during World War II with the Churchill AVRE and was not directly linked to infantry fire support. So, does infantry lose firepower support in such situations? Not necessarily. 
With advancements in technology, infantry's marching speed has increased due to mechanized vehicles, making their fire support lighter and more direct. Initially, the U.S. had the M113 and the Soviet Union had the BTR-60. The former utilized a .50 caliber machine gun, while the latter used a 14.5 mm KPVT plus 7.62 mm PKT machine gun turret. During this time period, armored vehicles directly assumed the task of providing fire support for infantry. These armored vehicles not only facilitated the transportation of infantry into the battlefield under fire, but also provided direct suppressive fire when dismounted to attack enemy positions, covering the infantry's actions. At this point, some viewers might have questions. Since in the early Cold War, armored vehicles like the M113 and BTR-60 only had machine guns for fire support, how would they handle encountering fortified positions? There are primarily two methods. The first method is that recoilless rifles and light rocket launchers were already matured during this era. For example, with the M113 armored vehicle, infantry could install the M4100 6mm recoilless rifle on its spacious platform. Additionally, soldiers could carry the M72 light rocket launcher to bombard fortifications. Therefore, if the fortifications were not permanent bunkers, direct fire artillery support was generally unnecessary. By 1966, the first infantry fighting vehicle in history, the BMP-1, was introduced, which elevated the level of infantry fire support. During this stage, the Soviet Union pioneered the installation of a low-recoil 73mm smoothbore gun on the infantry fighting vehicle, providing the BMP-1 with the ability to use both high-explosive and armor-piercing rounds simultaneously, performing anti-tank and anti-infantry tasks in a single battle. However, this raised another issue. The 73mm smoothbore gun had inherent design flaws. It had insufficient explosive content and fragmentation for anti-personnel purposes, and its armor-piercing capability was weak due to low-velocity rounds. It was difficult to hit targets due to the slow flight speed of the projectiles. After some compromises and trade-offs, the Soviet Union first installed anti-tank missiles on the BMP-1, creating the BMP-1P with enhanced anti-tank capabilities. Subsequently, the configuration of the 73mm smoothbore gun plus at three anti-tank missiles was replaced with a 30mm 2A42 autocannon plus at five anti-tank missiles. The 30mm 2A42 autocannon had higher muzzle velocity, faster rate of fire, and a flatter trajectory, making it more effective against light armored targets, vehicles, light fortifications, and infantry compared to the 73mm smoothbore gun. The burden of anti-tank combat was shifted to the anti-tank missiles carried on the vehicle. Therefore, at this point, the familiar image of infantry being supported by infantry fighting vehicles in terms of firepower had already taken shape. The combination of autoguns and anti-tank missiles became the mainstream configuration for infantry fighting vehicles in various countries. Examples include the M2 Bradley, Lynx, and CV-90 infantry fighting vehicles, all utilizing this layout. However, there is one issue, since the main guns of infantry fighting vehicles are often small caliber autocannons, this poses a significant problem. When faced with targets that small caliber autocannons cannot handle, anti-tank missiles need to be launched. However, the number of onboard anti-tank missiles is limited. If there are too many such targets and the anti-tank missiles are depleted, the infantry fighting vehicle will be left vulnerable if it encounters enemy tanks. In response to this dilemma, there are other methods to consider. One approach is the development of a dedicated fire support vehicle that does not carry infantry. By eliminating the need for infantry transport, the vehicle can allocate the extra weight to carry more and heavier weaponry. This type of fire support vehicle can effectively replace infantry fighting vehicles in coordinating with tanks while providing cover for dismounted infantry during combat. It serves as a heavily armed escort for main battle tanks and contributes to the firepower output within the armored infantry group. This new concept is known as the Armored Infantry Fire Support Vehicle and a specific example is the Escort Tank 57. 
As the name suggests, it is equipped with a 57mm gun, specifically the Bofors SAKL-70 MK.1. Familiar with Bofors, viewers may know that it is a naval gun with a caliber of 57mm. It can fire various rounds, including armor-piercing, high-explosive, and time-fuse airburst rounds. When firing armor-piercing rounds, it poses a significant threat to the flanks and rear of main battle tanks. Its high-explosive rounds have a larger payload compared to 20 to 30 mm small-caliber cannons, making them more effective against fortifications. The most useful ammunition is the 57 mm time-fuse airburst round, which serves as an anti-aircraft shell. This means that the Escort Tank 57 can protect tanks from armed helicopters and allow them to focus on ground combat. Therefore, the Escort Tank 57 introduces a new definition as an AIFSV, which becomes the origin of a series of modern fire support vehicles in subsequent contexts. During the Chechen Wars, Russian tanks faced ambushes from RPG teams and snipers positioned in high-rise buildings. This battle made the Russian military realize that tanks in urban warfare environments were highly vulnerable. The entire top of a tank becomes a target for enemy attacks. The BMP-2 infantry fighting vehicle, which was tasked with providing cover for tanks within the Russian military, although capable of elevating its gun to engage some upper floors of buildings, had no means to effectively counter RPG threats. Even large caliber machine guns can penetrate its roof armor from top to bottom, killing the crew inside. The method of using the MTLB with the ZSU-23-2 anti-aircraft gun was even more of a suicide mission. Although the ZSU-23-2 had excellent elevation angles, the crew members were completely exposed, allowing AK rifles and SVD sniper rifles to kill them without any difficulty. As a result, there was a clear demand for Russian Army fire support vehicles. These vehicles needed to be as heavily armored as tanks and equipped with cannons. Thus, the only fire support vehicle based on a tank chassis was created, known as the BMPT. It utilized the chassis of the T-72 tank and featured a remote control turret carrying a pair of two A-42 autocannons. The turret also included a set of dual launch at nine anti-tank missile launchers. However, since the BMPT is specifically designed as a fire support vehicle to protect tanks, it is not categorized as an AIFSV like the Escort Tank 57. Instead, it falls under the classification of an armored fighting vehicle, AFV. In reality, heavy infantry fighting vehicles like the Neymar IFV and Puma IFV have already provided infantry with the ability to withstand the direct firepower of enemy infantry fighting vehicles even including defense against anti-tank missiles launched by enemy infantry fighting vehicles. Therefore, AIFSVs led by the Escort Tank 57 are relatively rare in contemporary contexts. Instead, many countries have started manufacturing AFV fire support vehicles that are more focused on providing cover for tanks. Examples include the M7A3 Bradley Fist, which leans toward information reconnaissance and target guidance, or those equipped with large-caliber autocannons and anti-tank missiles. The French EBRC Jaguar, which emphasizes increased mobility with a wheeled chassis. However, in the future, there is a trend towards fusion in fire support vehicles. Most of these vehicles will inevitably gain air defense capabilities due to the high rate of fire of autoguns when providing fire support. So, based on this line of thinking, it is possible for some air defense vehicles to also serve as fire support vehicles. For example, the U.S. military's LAVAD is equipped with a quad stinger launcher, rocket pods, and an M61 Vulcan Gatling gun. Among these weapons, only the Stinger missile cannot directly engage ground targets. However, the MSHORAD system prepared by the U.S. military for the Striker Brigade includes the Hellfire anti-tank missile, which can be used to engage low-flying aerial targets. Naturally, as an anti-tank missile, the Hellfire can also engage ground tanks. This implies that an air defense vehicle equipped with electro-optical tracking and infrared surface-to-air missiles can also serve as a type of fire support vehicle. 
This directly demonstrates that fire support vehicles and short-range air defense vehicles share similarities, differing only in the type of missiles carried on the common weapon mounts, either anti-tank or air defense missiles. Therefore, in future fire support vehicles, it is possible to see a universal missile launcher with a large caliber gun. The missiles would have a dual function for air defense and anti-tank capabilities. This way, the vehicle can provide air defense cover for tanks and use its gun to engage enemy infantry and light armored vehicles, thereby saving the tank's main gun ammunition. Some may consider this concept of a universal missile launcher as too far-fetched, but in reality, the U.S. military developed such a system back in the 1990s. It was called the M2 Adat system, based on the M2 Bradley chassis. The new generation of fire support vehicles is almost ready, awaiting only the final push of demand. 